happy to have you back to what happens to be our 181st episode of our ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. Traditionally broadcasting live from the opposite ends of the world. So today is just one end of the world because our co-host DeSoto being the nature of the vintage and treasures uh, currently his systems up on his vintage uh, home up the uh, Diamond Head Hill uh, is down. So we need to get that back and uh, need some care. So uh, I will now be today on behalf of us, DeSoto and myself here back in Bavaria, Germany. If we can get the first slide up, um, it shows us again what we're always doing, oscillating between uh, both of our cultures here. And this is uh, talking about that uh, things sometimes have to get worse before they get better. So uh, Joe Biden had just to reinstate, as it says here, the, the travel ban for us Europeans to come to keep our cases down in, in Hawaii. And it sort of reminded us that coming full circle to the beginning, the heydays of tourism in, uh, in Honolulu, DeSoto uh, taught me, I always have my weekly German lesson with him. And in return, he gives me, continues to give me English uh, sayings, lessons. So he, he taught me the term newspaper clipping and that's what he's doing. So here is from the Star Advertiser, looking back uh, pieces here, uh, this gentleman that you see at the very bottom right, who is Willy Brandt, who at that time, as the subtitle says, was the mayor of the city of Berlin. And you see him here relaxing uh, on the beach of Waikiki. You see the, um, uh, basically the Royal Hawaiian in the back. And here he is with uh, swimming trunks and a Loa shirt. And it took him until a decade later to finally become the chancellor, which is the equivalent to the president of the United States of Germany. And so um, that basically made him then being uh, in the time of the late uh, 60s to uh, mid 70s. And so at that time in, in 59, just do our little history memory, that was the beginning of statehood when uh, Hawaii became the 50th states. And that basically boosted uh, tourism. Uh, so he was kind of the pioneer to that degree. And let's uh, go to the next slide and look at the other end of the world, how basically it all looked uh, in Germany at that time. And this here is almost looks like, reminds of a Wiley coffee lounge, that uh, coffee house that unfortunately closed, uh, I think last year. And also um, it has a little bit of a ticky touch and that makes me uh, wanna congratulate my best German buddy, Stefan, who we know from previous shows as the ticky basement uh, expert and of both of us having celebrated one of my recent birthdays at one of the most tiki places in the world, which is Trader Vix, uh, oddly in the basement of Munich's uh, most upscale hotel in downtown Munich. This place here, however, isn't a restaurant as it looks like, but it's a cafeteria and a dining facility in a place that we need to connect both worlds and that we started out increasingly with, uh, with the airborne traffic of aviation connecting us half around the world, which gets us to the next slide. So congratulations, Stefan, again, happy birthday. It's your birthday today. So all the best health and happiness first and foremost. So here we see uh, what I grew up with uh, is my uh, hometown uh, of Hanover Airport here that has been uh, built, as it says, in the, in the early 70s. And uh, Stefan knows this more from the inside because he was doing um, basically um, work there as, as a student and even before um, he was uh, having a job there at uh, helping to get the, the luggage into the airplanes. So he always told me these exciting stories about this, uh, is by this airport here, which again, we're missing Mr. DeSoto Brown. And instead we're reporting on this episode two about Father Brown, who's the nickname for this uh, vintage architect of my hometown, whose name is Heinz Wilke. And Heinz Wilke again was the uh, architect of our airport as well. 
He was highly influenced by Miesian modernism, as you can tell here. And he was using a material that's foreign. And we said, we caution everyone else to get overly excited about it for our tropics because it's a material that's maybe too invasive for it was just steel, but he was mainly using steel. You can see at the very top right, the project under construction. There's a little sign up there that's really kind of tragic because we were reporting on uh, uh, another project of his in the last show, which is almost the sibling half around the world of our varsity building that we're worried about Kamehameha School, maybe thinking about tearing it down. As this uh, German Hanover uh, sibling has been torn down uh, and uh, it has been torn down by uh, a contractor company who owned it and used it as their headquarters. And then it was Rüterbau. And I was rubbing my eyes when I saw this historic picture of the airport under construction, because guess what? The sign up there says Rüterbau. So this is particularly tragic that they have been instrumental in Father Brown's work than having sort of owned and occupied one of his buildings and having it torn down. That's really tragic. Once again, it reminds us of Kamehameha School, owner of the varsity building. So please, please Kamehameha School, Kamehameha Schools, keep it, it's a keeper and not tearing it down. So uh, let's go to the next slide and check out how this, uh, my hometown uh, airport um, has been looking uh, from inside. Uh, here you see um, very kind of spacey, the elevator as an object in the space and very kind of signature style for Father Brown. That's where his nickname comes from, that his favorite color for materials in the building was the color brown. So you see this uh, dropped ceiling here made out of these kind of sections of hollow tubes that were uh, powder coated in, guess what, brown and also had the lighting integrated in it. So next slide, it uh, created this sort of brownish, very cozy, very warm, uh, you know, not very institutional looking atmosphere of an airport, very kind of homey almost, just by the choice of that warm color and, and lighting enhancing that. And I remember that from my childhood I threw in that show quote with, um, that we had uh, with our friend Ron Lindgren, who was uh, making comments about the military diner we have been designing and sort of a similar atmosphere, a very kind of a, um, kind of a celebratory, uh, kind of celebrating the, the space and the warmth of space, uh, kind of along the same lines. Uh, next slide, shockingly, uh, last time we've been reporting on his prime project of, a, of a, the headquarters of a, a local a people's bank, the Sparkasse, that architect has been turning gold into silver. So usually you do the opposite, right? Because gold is more valuable than silver, but here for some reasons, and in the past um, show reporting, they, these were other architects, but we've been uh, reporting that when Father Brown passed away uh, in the early 90s at the young age of only in his mid 60s, uh, some of his staff members basically took over the office. So they were responsible and in charge of the remodeling of the airport of the founding principal of the firm, Heinz Wilke, and they did the same as the other architect, basically they silverized it. So once again, turning gold into silver versus keeping gold. So um, a way more sort of sterile look, uh, having basically, um, you know, done the, the ceiling in, in more bright and white. Also as a reference, I guess, to not make the look, the ceiling so, so naked, they have these kind of sticks kind of uh, yeah, sticking out and the lighting somehow being part of that. But again, a very, very different feel, almost like feels more like a hospital, feels less warm, feels less homey, uh, feels way more institutionalized. So going to the next slide, uh, what does it all have to do with us in Honolulu? We see these similarities here. The top rows are shows about uh, our aviation heritage uh, in Honolulu by uh, the architect of uh, DeSoto's home uh, uh, building, uh, Vladimir Asipov. Again, um, 
having worked in the same era as we know uh, the, uh, the, the, our airport in Honolulu, a very fine example of tropical modernism, using basically local materials as cast in place concrete, uh, local wood, local koa wood, uh, you know, touching it up, making the concrete feel more warm, uh, very exquisite um, attention to detailing. Again, very distinguished. Um, DeSoto did a show about um, recommendations for uh, how to live in the pandemic as being embracing easy breezy. And as he pointed out, as we quote on the top right, the airport being a perfect example for that. So what we see down there is uh, the newest addition to the airport. Here's a rendering uh, by the firm quoted on the very top, uh, bottom left that's doing the work. And once again, we're kind of missing uh, working in that tradition, in that heritage of the tropical exotic. Um, we're, we're seeing this way more technical, seeing this way more, um, you know, um, again, sterile and, and kind of um, high techy looking. So once again, where is the attention uh, to tradition, we would say, uh, we're, we're missing that. Uh, next slide. We go to um, an airport here that I'm uh, not want to screw up on pronouncing it, so I'm doing my best. Is Shere Medyevo, which is one of the airports in Moscow in Russia. And uh, Heinz Wilke um, amazingly made himself a reputation, basically with our hometown Hanover Airport, to also get the commission as someone from the West to design one of the most prestigious um, uh, airports behind the Iron Curtain at that, at that time, at the beginning of the Reagan era and uh, our Chancellor Cole uh, deeply into the kind of the Cold War era. But again, um, sometimes architecture is sort of resisting um, basically sort of problematic zeitgeist. And uh, Heinz Wilke, once again, um, you see uh, you know, similarity to the Hanover Airport here, the same drop ceiling with the hollow tubes in brown. And you can also see these kind of chandeliers uh, with these uh, illuminated bubble glass lighting fixtures that once again, intend to create a, a more homey, a more cozy atmosphere in the airport rather than a, a sterile institutional one. Um, next slide. Uh, no surprise probably that um, things have changed there too. Uh, the airport then uh, sort of having uh, gotten a little bit um, out of well, I shouldn't say style, but um, hasn't really had the, um, I guess it's, um, it's relevance anymore as a hub. But recently in, um, in, in, the, in the last couple of years, uh, they have regained that and they needed to add on to the airport. Uh, what you see at the top left um, is a rendering of what has been actually executed by now. At the bottom there also, uh, these are new terminals that have been added. And obviously uh, we've been talking about Emperor's new clothes. The architect thought to basically um, add their own um, handwriting at their own signature and didn't really care so much about uh, the tradition that, that Wilke brought to the place. That reminds us uh, um, uh, the show we had done with Larry Stricker about his Ihilani. His Ihilani was pretty much the same as the original terminal was here by Hans Wilke for the airport. And once again, there is this, the bottom picture of this sort of megalomanic kind of blobby thing uh, that seems to be way more a formalist gesture than a performatively functional uh, zeitgeist. See, once again, this proposal of this new phase of, um, of Aulani out there with this sort of monstrous blob that again, we, we wish um, it, it would show more substance than just um, surfacial kind of flashiness. And once again, um, why are we even asking to be a little bit more respectful um, of the original condition and let be more, uh, let, let, let oneself be more working within that tradition gets us to the next slide. This is our reading assignment of our 
uh, steel uh, manual atlas here. And guess what? Uh, that airport in Moscow made it into that Bible of steel architecture. So once again, um, we, we tell our colleagues and developers and architects before you start thinking about doing whatever you want to do, do your homework, do your precedent study, uh, you know, find out what really is uh, what you're finding, what kind of um, position does it have in the, in the history of architecture, and then go from there. And then maybe you're a little bit more considerate about the kind of novelty you want to bring. And maybe it's more about evolving a genetic code uh, that's, that's sort of embedded and, and, and embodied in the project. Uh, the cool effect, obviously, I mean, these projects kind of show this sort of desire to make things more cool. Next slide, uh, was, was Heinz Wilken not able to do that? Sure he was, look at that. Doesn't that look space agey? Uh, sure it does. And next slide, it's part of uh, this project here, which is, a, which is a Congress center in the city of Dusseldorf, built in, in 74. And you see at the very, very bottom left, this is the skywalk that leads from the other side of the streets and the parking to the thing. Uh, this Congress Center very much is uh, showing one of the prime uh, formal elements of the 70s, which is the four to five degree angle. If there's something is very typical for the 70s, it's the 45 degree angle. You can see here in plan, that's pretty much like, um, a compilation of uh, multiple octagons. And um, you see at the top right, this very neat picture uh, that I pulled all from this amazing website, Build Index, that we're crediting at the very bottom there, that shows that, uh, once again, it seems to be a sibling of the Sparkasse Bank we were showing last time. And that alludes to SOM's uh, Sears Tower in Chicago this kind of staggering of the same geometry and bringing it to different heights. And here you can see that these kind of uh, lower one story entry canopy pavilions. And then the next ones are basically also a roof terraces for outdoor congregations here kind of beautifully poetically furnished with uh, different colored kind of chairs. So uh, next slide. Speaking about the 45 degree angle as that signal for 70s architecture is another project by Hans Wilke back to my hometown of Hanover. This is really down in the urban core of the city. And um, it's very strange. You can see here, there's some lanai's as we call them in Honolulu and in Hawaii. There's some balconies there basically sticking out and they're doing this sort of crisscrossy alternating once again in plan in a 45 degree angle. And what is that strange building? Go to the next slide. It's something that is very familiar to us because we're having it a lot on the island from the past. This is actually a parking garage that is, uh, has a multi-purpose. Also, there's a bowling alley at the very bottom. And then there is office space at the top where the client uh, that are the client organization that as we were telling the story in the last show, our client representative for our first kindergarten uh, was working for and um, they were basically headquartered at the top of this building. So I was very, you know, used and familiar with the building and my dad and I went there a couple of times and the few times we had to wait, we were looking down on the, on, the, on the floors and where the floor uh, touches the walls. And there was this beautiful Carl uh, Heinz Wilke, Father Brown custom made baseboard. It was basically routed out on its uh, back that is touching the wall. So it was creating the shadow reveal and seemed to be more floating versus just attached to the wall, a, be a beautiful kind of detailing. And certainly uh, sort of subconsciously to some degree, probably the detailing of us in the kindergarten was, was, was an homage uh, to that project. At the very top there, you see vintage uh, images from that build index from, from the bowling alley. And next slide, 
it shows you the parking garage from the outside. Once again, uh, we did a show about the uh, proletarian people power parking plinths and saying if we would basically remove individual car traffic from the island and replace it with a multimodal alternatives, you would basically free up uh, most of that parking space for other usages. Uh, the most in need is basically housing, it's dwelling. And so uh, again, this is a brutalist parking garage and up there is uh, a couple of the quotations from the many brutalist parking garages we have on our island. So there's another kind of a reference. Once again, uh, we're having winter right now, so you can't survive in a repurposed for a dwelling parking garage here in Hanover, Germany. It's freezing cold, but you can in Honolulu. So be aware of our unique selling park position of having the most um, perfect climate in the world. Next slide. Next slide is showing a, another typology of Karl-Heinz Wilke. This is uh, what used to be designed as the British Embassy in my, in, um, in my hometown. It's an exoskeleton. He was the master of steel. Here you can see a core 10 steel exoskeleton uh, column. And that reminds us of our Aloha Stadium, which is currently proposed to be redeveloped. Uh, the excuse is there's too much corrosion there and too much rusting, but then again, does that mean it's worth tearing it down and remodeling it? Or could you try to save it in basically doing some bone replacements? We're just throwing this out as an alternative because once again, I was just talking to Ulf Maya, my friend Ulf, uh, who was basically saying and wrote an article about, you know, you should try to maintain a building as much as you can because you can never make up for the carbon footprint wasted if you replace it with something that's not anywhere close to be built without a carbon footprint. So next slide here, uh, talking repurposing, uh, when the uh, British embassy moved out of this building, uh, Wilke moved in with his, uh, with his office and him personally with his residence. You can see the little pictures up there. And again, uh, brutalism is something that National Docomomo has been picking up saying uh, we're turning, all these projects are turning uh, basically 50s, so 70s turning 50s. And so um, we're basically sensitizing us and the public about that these are treasures. You can see the project here um, is very heavy on what we think every building in Hawaii should have lanai, is right? Every basically unit even having been office space before um, is basically now um, has a lanai. And the concrete is basically interestingly used um, in, a, in a more tectonic way as an applied non log bearing facade versus our most favorite and, and famous uh, building of tropical brutalism, which is the Royal Hawaiian uh, shopping mall on Kalakaua Avenue that we've been reporting about and we quote on the top right. Next slide, another project by, uh, by Father Brown is uh, here, which used to be the Army Officers School, which he built in later in the late 70s. You can see what uh, DeSoto was uh, recognizing and, and really sort of praising uh, was this sort of corrugation of, of concrete. Um, I have a very personal relationship to that because um, um, as you can see, Joey, my oldest son up there uh, in this building, I was able to get myself out of a life of having to serve as a Lieutenant of Reserve for the German military. So uh, leaving Hanover, Germany and spending the last couple of minutes here back in Hawaii, uh, next slide here in Honolulu is basically uh, what DeSoto keeps me updated. This is a project on the left by the architect of my dwelling, uh, Ernest Hara in downtown Honolulu from the 80s, where he was staying true to modernism and having not been caught up in, in postmodernism. So kudos. But unfortunately, now what you can see, we were shocked to see what happened to the gold bond building. There's someone who is sort of redraping the building with some uh, glass and turning, you know something that potentially shades into thermal mass, which is really bad. While one could have been cladding it with this German product that we call Tiamo, which is by um, Glasbau Hahn, which are these triple glazed 
a passive house, um, really high energy efficient louvers that one could have reglazed the building uh, and, and could have enhanced its energy performance. Next slide. Um, also, I think uh, we have to criticize ourselves when it comes to, because that's a bank building. So we've been reporting on the, uh, um, on the um, uh, American savings banks that probably we as members need to speak up more. I know that Tropical Rockwood is a member of the American Savings Bank. And I have to admit, uh, I got uh, some mail today by look at that sign up there, uh, up here, which is that Sparkasse. So I'm a member of the Sparkasse, so, so I should speak more up. Um, next slide is also shocking news of DeSoto here. Uh, showing us what happens to the Walgreens building on Kapiolani Boulevard that we've been reporting about being very critical to be very invasive, um, a greedy development to begin with. And after some years now, it's been closed down and being graffitied. And we're afraid, you know, it's only be built as an interim phase to finally redevelop that as a high rise. Next slide. And as a high rise, we're worried about because the architect is architect Hawaii. And they're also uh, in charge of the Mandarin Oriental that you can see at the very top. And, and next to the side, they're doing this one Alamoana building. And all of them seem to be one, again, more invasive, hermetic uh, nature. And we're, we're basically recommending, for example, Architects Hawaii to the gentleman we see at the very bottom left, at uh, top left, who's Frank Haynes, who's a founding principal uh, in Architects Hawaii. And they've, doing this phenomenal building as for example the Ken Rock building that now gets redeveloped by the by the by the tower we see on top and you see that the nature of architects why at the very beginning was tropical exotic was bioclimatic so we kind of you know appeal to the firm and basically say look at that look at your own roots and basically try to return to them which gets us to the last slide is this possible? We think yes, the emerging generation thinks so. We're working on these primitivas, which are way more than what we see on Kapiolani Boulevard. It's trees, the big trees. And so we're thinking, you know, in the tradition of Frank, basically make more stack lanai, easy breezy towers. And we're currently working on Primitiva 3, which is in uh, inspired um, and uh, by the great Fry Otto. And so uh, at the top right, you see uh, what we're working on. And this gets us to the end of the show and announcing that we're gonna have one of our mentors for the next three shows, who is Larry Medlin, who was a personal collaborator with Fry Otto, has been working with him on the 67 um, uh, American Pavilion in Montreal. He has been best friends with the great Conrad Waxman and he has been dancing, invited to dance by Janis Joplin. And if, you know, I don't know if it takes anything else to get you more excited to tune back in next week for our 132nd episode of Human Humane Architecture. And until then, obviously stay healthy and happy first and foremost, but increasingly again, uh, tropically exotic. Bye-bye.